webinar uh, that Dave has presented. Um, this uh, first one was on just the, the guidelines and, and what we've uh, come up with or what's been come up with uh, through um, uh, consultation with experts around the province and, and uh, the literature and so on. And, and today is, is a talk that um, is more focused on what is the evidence that uh, was used to uh, come up with the guidelines and, and the current thinking. So it's my pleasure to welcome uh, Dr. David Sweet, who is an emergency physician at uh, Vancouver General Hospital, and as well as an intensivist uh, who uh, works at Vancouver General Hospital as well as Surrey Memorial Hospital, and um, is a clinical assistant professor and has been uh, spearheading um, sepsis management uh, through his work with uh, evidence to excellence and now with uh, clinical care management. So it's my pleasure to welcome uh, Dr. David Sweet, and uh, thank you very much for attending this morning. Thank you, David. Yeah. Thank you. Yes. Thanks a lot. Uh, thanks for the nice introduction. Good morning, everybody. Um, first off, thank you very much for coming to this early lecture. I, I know it's early and sometimes difficult to make, too. And uh, additionally, thank you for uh, supporting and being interested in uh, emergency department sepsis improvement. So today, I'm going to try to focus on really three different things. First off, um, I'm going to reintroduce a little bit about the history of what we've done here in BC and a brief introduction again of clinical care management. But primarily, I'm going to focus on uh, the current literature um, around early sepsis management, how we use those to develop our guidelines and walk us through the guidelines. And I'm going to try, finally, to really underline and emphasize certain key interventions that we know improve outcomes. So, as usual, I like to do a little bit of um, going through the definitions of some of the terms we're going to hear today so everyone's aware. Um, the terms you're going to hear are SIRS, or Systemic Inflammatory Response. And this generally means that you have two out of four of what you see there, either a high or low temperature, a uh, high heart rate, a high or low white count, or a high rest rate. And you'll see occasionally in some of the sepsis protocols that they remove the white blood cell count because we don't have those at triage and replace it with a change in the level of consciousness. Now, you have two out of four of those and a presumed in or suspected infection, and you have sepsis. Now, if sepsis goes on to um, organ failure, we usually call that severe sepsis. But for ease, many of the sepsis protocols, many of the studies have just replaced an elevated lactate as a sign of severe sepsis. Now, if that progresses on the hypotension, we get shock or septic shock. And really, the literature um, supports that we should really be careful to look for these types of patients, the ones with the elevated lactate and the ones with shock, because this is where we get the most improvement in mortality with early aggressive measures. Now, we've been seeing more and more sepsis in the last 10 years, and we're going to see more. Uh, this primarily has to do with the, the factors you hear us see on this slide. On the left, you can see the population is getting older. We have more nosocomial infections and more resistance. Additionally, we have more immunocompromised individuals being either from HIV or from medications for autoimmune diseases or transplant. And next, we're doing more intense things to people. We have more invasive devices, more complex surgical procedures, and more life-saving technology. So we're going to see more sepsis, not less. But we still see that there's a significant mortality in our population from severe sepsis, even with all the research that has gone into it. In a study from last year looking at sepsis specifically in Canadian hospitals, um, a couple key things came out. First off, it still remains the leading cause of hospital mortality with a mortality of 38%. Overall, 10.9% uh, of all hospital deaths can be attributed to sepsis. From 2005 to 2009, severe sepsis hospitalizations increased 17%, and 80% of those came to the emergency department. So obviously how we recognize these people and how we treat these people is going to have a significant impact. So why are we talking about this today? Well, I think that um, since the publication of Emmanuel Rivers in 2001, Early Goal-Directed Therapy, it really highlighted the importance of early aggressive management. And it's led to a stream of studies and literature that's come out that's helped us understand what's really important in these individuals. I do want to quickly go over Rivers' trial just so to keep everyone up to speed on the concepts that it presented to us. So what Rivers did is he looked at patients that presented to the emergency department with two out of four SIRS criteria um, and a suspected infection and had either a, a systolic blood pressure after a fluid bolus or a lactate greater than four. And the reason for this is 
the concept is this is either macrovascular shock being hypotension or microvascular shock being a high lactate. Significant that if we're not delivering enough oxygen to the cells, that the cells have to switch from aerobic to anaerobic metabolism and lactate produced, therefore microvascular shock. So if you had one of those two things, that you got randomized to the left here, where we see, oh, sorry, I just want to pull up the marker. The standard therapy. Sorry, one second. The standard therapy group. And this group got very good treatment. They got central lines placed. They got arterial lines placed. They got fluid to get a CVP of 8 to 12 basal pressures to get a MAP up to 65, and also fluid to titrate to urine output of 0.5 cc per kilo per hour. This was done for six hours, and then they went up to the ICU. Now, if you got randomized to the early goal-directed therapy, they got the same monitors. They also got their um, fluids to a CPP of 8 to 12, basal pressures to a MAP of 65, and the urine output titrated to. But finally, they looked at the central venous oxygen saturation. Now, why is this important? Well, this is the blood coming back to the right side of the heart. For most people, it has a saturation still of 70%. So if it's less than 70%, it signifies that you're not delivering enough oxygen to the tissues. Therefore, it's either you're anemic and don't have enough oxygen carrying capacity, or your cardiac output is low, and therefore you need augmentation of your cardiac output to increase that delivery. So you can see here is if the saturation was low, they got blood to get a hemocrit greater than 30%, and if it was still low, they added dobutamine to increase the cardiac output and therefore hopefully improve oxygen delivery. So in doing this one intervention, just looking at central venous oxygen saturation, they found an absolute risk reduction of 16%, number needed to treat of seven. Now this was an astronomical increase compared to anything we'd seen in sepsis before, and therefore it brought um, a lot of interest to this concept and idea, and much of the world uptook this concept immediately without validation. Now, <clears throat> what were the differences between these groups? Uh, besides the treatment protocol. One of the primary things that is focused on is the amount of fluid they got in the first six hours. So you can see the standard group got around three and a half liters of fluid, where the early goal-directed group got around five liters of fluid. So most people attribute this improved mortality from early aggressive fluid resuscitation. Now, there is a lot of controversy over the Rivers trial, and I want to highlight a few of these points. This is one of the most important ones. What you're looking at here is a graph where on the x-axis you see an Apache score, which is acute physiology and chronic health evaluation score. This is a score that if you calculate the worst numbers that the patient has in the first 24 hours, it will correlate with mortality. On the y-axis, you see 28-day mortality. Now, the, what you'll see on the graph are its previous sepsis trials showing that when the Apache scores generally line up on this line with mortality, for severe sepsis patients. And if you look up here in the left upper corner, this is where Rivers Control Group was. So had a low Apache score, but a very high mortality. So people didn't understand why the mortality was so high in this trial. Now, looking back, it seems that because of the place where Rivers did the trial in Detroit, it's a very low social and economic status. And therefore, patients showed up to the emergency room very far into their disease compared to many other areas um, of North America. In addition, there is a very high proportion of patients with uh, hypertension and diabetes, and therefore likely contributed to the high mortality they saw, as well as um, the number of patients that required dobutamine to augment cardiac output, as they, many of them late in their disease had a low cardiac output. A couple other comments. People are unsure of the utility of giving red blood cells in this circumstance, even though it was part of the protocol. Um, there are downsides to giving red blood cells, that, such as immune modulation contained changes to the hemocoagulation profile. And one of the concepts additionally is that with giving red blood cells, that central venous oxygen saturation went up. But many people feel that because of the age of the red blood cells being transfused, they were less likely to deliver their oxygen and they hold on to their oxygen. So that even though the central venous oxygen sac goes up, in fact, they're not delivering any more oxygen. Next. The, all, the whole trial was a bundle of procedures or a bundle of interventions, and no one's really sure which ones are important and which aren't. So for anyone to use this data, they basically have to implement the entire bundle with the red blood cells, antidobutamine, et cetera, because we don't know which ones are actually important, such as 
do we really need to have central venous lines above the diaphragm? Do we really need to look at the central venous oxygen saturation? Or are there other markers such as lactate clearance, which would be much easier and less invasive? But more importantly, um, which hasn't been published but has been spoken of commonly, is that the way the actual trial was done, and there's a single line in the Rivers paper that describes this, but the treatment group or the control group on the left side there, the pay that was usually run by the emergency physician who was on service in the department at the time. So you could imagine that if you're looking after maybe 10, 15 other people in the department, but you're also trying to run this protocol, it can be very difficult um, to be on top of the CVP, the MAP, the urine output, et cetera. Where if you got randomized to the treatment group, um, and uh, they were going to be looking at your central venous oxygen saturation, one of the emergency, senior emergency residents or Rivers himself came in and ran the protocol. So many people questioned whether just having really good attentive care and one-on-one -on -one care actually improves mortality, and that's why they got more fluid, and that's why they did better. But really, we have to wonder whether this matters, all the discussion about the Rivers trial, because the real question is, do sepsis protocols work? In a study done from last year, they took all the sepsis protocols that had implemented some form of oral studies that implemented some form of a sepsis protocol and looked at the mortality reduction from 2001 all the way up to 2010. And what we see is there's an absolute risk reduction of around 20% with a number needed to treat a five, even better than what Rivers originally reported. And just so you can compare this to some other data, when we use thrombolytics for elevation MI, it has an absolute risk reduction of around 2% or a number needed to treat of around 50. When we take the people to the cath lab over thrombolytics for S elevation MI, on top of that, there's another absolute risk reduction of 1% versus for a number needed to treat of 100. And when we use PCI for non S elevation MI, it's an absolute risk reduction of around 1.55% for a number needed to treat of 64. So you can see that we put a lot of focus on MIs and especially the interventions we do for them. But you can see that the early aggressive management of sepsis patients have a much bigger bang for your buck. They've looked at cost effectiveness of sepsis protocols and found that using them actually causes a 23.4% reduction in hospital costs due to the patient not getting sicker and needing escalating care. So this leads us now to talk a little bit about evidence of excellence, which we formed back in the mid-2000s, and it was a quality proven initiative that used online community of practices, electronic community of practice, where different hospitals could interact with each other and have discussions around sepsis care as well as, um, as, well as ED flow. And could you discuss barriers they've encountered, how they overcame them, their, um, their victories, and how um, the successes they had with their sepsis protocols. We had a great clinical staff, including Mike Hertel from Kelowna, Brent Woodley from uh, Chilliwack, um, Julian, of course, and Rod Stentrum from St. Paul's, Katie Proctor, assistant at, and Kendall Holt from PGH. And we would, on, in addition to having um, the electronic chemistry practice, would have lectures similar to this one where we could discuss um, the literature as well as um, um, changes in our way we can manage patients in the emergency department. We'd have, as you see, over the year, we'd have learning sessions that people would all come to to attend, and we'd have face-to-face uh, -face meetings and discuss such as improvements. People would go back to their hospitals and then they'd run PDSA cycles um, on their sepsis protocol to try to improve uh, specific areas that they're interested in. And again, we'd come back and meet, and this happened several times throughout the year. In addition, we got a CHR grant to look at the management of these patients and collect data on them. So you can see here, this is an example from Penticton, where we could, individual patients could look at their time from liter of fluid, time to um, blood cultures, and time to antibiotic delivery. And then we could graph this and then over time show the improvements we're making. And again, Penticton here, he did such a great job. You can see that over the first 130 patients, uh, the variability that decreased in the time to uh, goals. So then clinical care management came around, which is a Ministry of Health initiated quality improvement project that's being implemented by the Patient Safety and Quality Council. And as Julian said, they're trying to improve the clinical management of nine different areas currently one of them being sepsis. And because of our work with E2E, we um, decided to start with the emergency department management of sepsis. So we wanted to have provincial-wide recommendations on management and as well as have reportable provincial measures. 
looking at the Hamas Ministry of uh, Health Services database, there's 111 facilities which provide emergency services in BC, 57 emergency departments, and over 10,000 visits per year, which we want to focus on. And so we're going to provide recommendations, educational resources, and as well as measures for these 57. For the other 54, we'll just uh, be able to utilize the recommendations, but we'll also be supporting them with educational resources. So now I want to start going through some of the recommendations and the evidence behind them. So I was very lucky in developing these guidelines. Um, I had a lot of help from people such as Emmanuel Rivers, Derek Angus, and Dave Hung of the Process Study, Scarf Wangard of the New York Sepsis Project, um, the E2E Sepsis Working Group, the Provincial Critical Care Working Group, as well as the Provincial Emergency Medicine Working Group, who were all signed off on these. And in addition, oh, sorry, the arrow got switched around there. Um, we also now have support of the CAPE C4, the Canadian Critical Care Council, um, which contains emergency and ICU physicians from across Canada who have now given us national um, uh, recognition of these guidelines. So first off, triage identification. Who do we need to be looking for? Well, similar to what we discussed there with Rivers, um, what we're looking for patients that show up to the emergency department with two or four SIRS and a suspected infection in one of the following markers of risk, and they should be triaged as a C-TAS too. Now, why did we add these markers of risk? Well, with our previous experience that if we don't add them, the sepsis protocols seem to be um, over-utilized and lose their sensitivity. Or sorry, gain sensitivity but lose their specificity. So therefore, we use these markers, which have been well documented, to be patients that are at an increased risk of severe sepsis. So it looks unwell, age greater than 65, recent surgery, immunocompromised patients, and patients with chronic illness. And again, we always keep looks unwell in there so that anyone the triage nurse is worried about, they can include in the sepsis pathway. When it comes to early recognition, one of the most important things I really want to focus on here is early lactate measurement and why it's so important. So it's well known now that lactate levels greater than four are actually a univariate predictor of mortality. And it's been documented in many sources, a few of which I'm going to discuss. In this study from 2005, looking at patients that presented to the emergency department with infections, over 1,000 patients, you can see that the death in three days and the death at 28 days increases substantially once the lactate is greater than four. Now, this did include people with very high lactates um, rather than just above four. So it's important to keep that in mind, but there was definitely an inflection point at four. And it seems to be coming out over and over again. In this study from just recently published, looking at using point of care lactate specifically in the mortality of patients with severe sepsis in Uganda. So they took point of care lactate to a place that had very low technological um, capabilities and try to see if it could help them determine who is going to be, um, who is going to die from the severe sepsis and not. And you can see what they found is just the same. So once that lactate hit four, at an 81% accuracy, so the most sensitive and specific number for a seven-fold higher mortality compared to a lactate concentration less than four. And this is 253 patients. So if it can be done in rural Uganda, I think it can be done anywhere in NBC. Another study looking at um, the products and values of lactate, and this is in a pre-hospital study. What they did here is, again, using point-of-care lactates in the ambulance to determine mortality in patients they're bringing to the emergency department. So if you can look here on the two different axes there, you have a systolic less than 100 or greater than 100 and a lactate less than 3.5 and greater than 3.5. So um, you can see that once the lactate goes through your port, greater than 3.5, no matter what your blood pressure is, you have a higher mortality, and specifically if you're also hypotensive. But, you know, really what we care often about is this patient group here, the ones that have a high blood pressure or a normal blood pressure and a high lactate. These are the ones that they, we have to decide, is it that important for us to know about them? Well, I'd say yes, and I can convince you their mortality is just as bad as shock. So unless you can say we don't need blood pressure cuffs at triage, then I also can say that we don't need lactate measurement in triage, which I don't think anyone would believe to be true. How common is it? Well, if you look at River's actual trial, the number of patients that had a lactate greater than four, one half of them had a MAP greater than 65. And actually one-fifth of the patients that had a lactate greater than four had a MAP greater than 90, or a totally normal blood pressure. Well, what was their mortality? Oh, something's happened here with our slide deck, unfortunately, sorry. Um, this is a trial that's presented recently this year, looking at 300 patients with severe sepsis or septic shock. And when they controlled for age, 
comorbidities and severity of illness, this is what they found. So actually the cryptogenic shock, or the patients with a normal blood pressure and a high lactate, had a worse mortality than patients with overt shock or hypotension and normal lactate. So therefore, it's just as important to know about these patients with the normal blood pressure and the high lactates than anyone in septic shock. So therefore, our recommendations is that we'd like to see a venous lactate measured within 30 minutes of presentation to triage. And these lactates have to have a rapid turnaround time of approximately 30 minutes. Sorry, that was also not supposed to be there. And if initial lactate is elevated, then it should be repeated in two to four hours. So why do we want to see another lactate repeated if the initial one is high? Well, there's several reasons for this. This is um, a study um, from 2004 that looked at early lactate clearance and how it like, related to septic shock mortality. You can see here, 111 patients, so the ones that cleared the lactate greater than 10%, had a much better mortality than ones that did not. So looking at septic shock, you can see the mortality went from 20 to 50% if they did not clear their lactate, and for severe sepsis from around 50% up to 70% in this sick patient group. And if you think about it, that lactate clearance of just 10% is not very much. So going from 4 down to 3.6 is all you need to show that you have a better mortality than someone who did not. Another study looking at two-hour lactate clearance and predicting the outcome with people with um, cardiovascular compromise. And so this is a rock curve, if you're not familiar with it. So that line that goes right up the middle um, is a 50-50 chance that the test that you're, that you're using will tell you if someone is going to die or not. And the closer you are to the left upper corner, the more sensitive and specific your test is. And you can see that 15% lactate clearance at two hours was the most sensitive and specific of all the different markers tested. This included MAP, SHOP index, baseline lactate, base excess. So obviously a very important marker to be aware of. And again, that lactate clearance of 10% has the max sensitivity and specificity for predicting in-hospital mortality. Now what about clearance of lactate used as a resuscitation goal? So can we actually try to reduce the lactate and try to be, and in trying to reduce the lactate improve mortality? Well, there's two studies that have looked at this. The first one was a multi-center open labeled randomized controlled trial from last year looking at lactate guided therapy. What they did is they took 348 patients and the control group used the centravenous oxygen sat just like rivers where the treatment group used the centravenous oxygen sat, but in addition, resuscitated with an algorithm to try to reduce the lactate um, by at least 20% um, in the first two hours. And this is what they found. So looking at in-hospital mortality, 43% versus 33.9%, p-value 0.076, not quite statistically significant, but a trend, and not a very large trial. The more popular quoted trial is the JAMA trial from Jones of last year. And what Jones did is did a multi-center randomized non-inferiority trial with 300 patients. So it's important to notice that he wasn't looking for superiority of lactate clearance, but just to show that it's not different or inferior to central venous oxygen saturation. The control group used a central venous oxygen sat of 70%. And the treatment group, they just tried to clear that lactate by 10% and not look at the central venous oxygen sat and I found no difference. Now, if we look at the actual patients in this group, 220 of them out of 300 required vasopressors, 80 of them out of 300 required mechanical ventilation, which is pretty consistent with um, emergency department um, sepsis patients, severe sepsis patients, but only 29 patients to 300 required either dobutamine or red blood cells in the first six hours. So when it came to improving the central venous oxygen sat, or improving the lactate, a very small number of patients actually require them to have that treatment. So it's difficult to say that one is not different than the other, but such a small group. But what this again shows us that if we look at 300 patients presenting to a typical large emergency department in North America, very few of them are actually so sick that they need to have the central venous sat or improved or the lactate improved. I'm going to say a couple words about um, Scott Weingart here in the New York Sepsis Collaborative. So if you guys listen to EMRAP, he's the one that does um, EM Crit and has many lectures on EMRAP. And he's doing something very similar to us. He's trying to implement sepsis protocols in 57 emerges in the New York area. 
and we have very similar guidelines, so we've been supporting each other um, through development of our guidelines and implementation. But he even took the lactate clearance a step further. So they actually, in their guidelines, recommend to resuscitate to improve lactate, where we've held off on this for the time being. So what is possible in Canada? Um, what are we able to do? Well, there's a study that we did that I was part of um, with the Canadian C4 group where we devised two different checklists. One checklist was a reasonable to achieve sepsis checklist, which is basically what's contained in our guidelines here for BC. We also derived a second checklist, which was more advanced techniques, such as true early goal-directed therapy with putting the central line above the diaphragm and looking at CVPs and central venous oxygen saturations. And we took these checklists and we sent it out to a number of emergency physicians, 20 rural physicians, 23 community physicians, and 81 um, tertiary level physicians. And this is what we found. So if you look on the left, this is the basic should achieve um, checklist. So be able to intubate, get a central line anywhere, give IV fluid, provide vasopressors if needed, check a lactate, give antibiotics in 60 minutes, and obtain cultures. And the green means that they could do it, and the red means they could not. So for the basic stuff, all the tertiary and community hospitals could. But if you look at the rural hospitals, only half felt they could put a central line in, and only a quarter felt they could get a lactate value. And we don't think this is um, this is appropriate. We feel that our rural community should also be able to check lactate values to find those um, sick patients. If you look at the center, the, the more um, aggressive checklist with um, early goal-directed therapy, you can see that, sorry, the slides messed up there again, um, the shift, but basically no one felt they could do early goal-directed therapy or true early goal-directed therapy. And in fact, um, they all could do uh, source control and they all could provide steroids, which is absolutely necessary as well. So the conclusion was that um, from this trial, as well as all this literature I've shown you, is that the ability to measure lactate and as well as place central lines needs to be supported by the hospital infrastructure. And it's very important that we be able to measure our lactates early, get the results to the clinicians, and be able to repeat them if required. I'm going to switch gears a little bit here and talk now about antibiotic delivery and cultures. So the 2008 Surviving Sepsis Camping Guidelines recommend that antibiotics Within, it should be given within the first hour of recognition of septic shock, grade 1B evidence, and severe sepsis, grade 1D evidence. And this is based primarily on expert opinion and results of retrospective studies. What is the most important study that people quote when discussing this? Well, this is the Kumar study from 2006 presented in Critical Care Medicine. And what he did is retrospective, retrospective review of 2,000 septic shock patients he looked at the time of their shock onset and to the time they got their antibiotics and how this related to mortality. This is his results and what he found. If you look on the left, you can see on the x-axis the time from hypotension in hours, and on the y-axis the odds, the odds ratio of death. And you can see almost immediately, starting at time zero from one to one to two hours, the odds ratio of death starts to increase. On this graph over here on the right, again, what you'll see is uh, the time from onset of shock on the x-axis. And each one of these points is number with the dark black line, the survival fraction, and the light line, the cumulative number of patients that got their antibiotics in time. And so you can see that stepwise change. But what it really concludes, as you can see at the bottom there, there's a reduction in survival of 7.6% for every hour of delay of getting antibiotics in the first six hours. Well, this is a real shocker to the sort of uh, emergency medic sepsis community because that is a huge number. As you know, maybe 10 years ago, it wouldn't be uncommon that someone comes in with hypotension, but they wouldn't get their antibiotics for four hours after they've come in, seen the physician, the orders have been written, the orders have gone to pharmacy, pharmacy sends the antibiotics up, and eventually the nurse delivers them. So those four hours that the patients are waiting for antibiotics could increase the mortality by 32%, which obviously isn't acceptable. Now, this has been confirmed in many prospective observational studies looking at giving antibiotics in different septic scenarios. And there's only one randomized trial that's been done so far in this area. And I like to present it just because I find it's interesting and I thought it was a really good idea. So what these guys in Australia did is they took 198 patients. And specifically in Australia, they have really long transport times. So when the call is made into the outback to go pick somebody up who's really unwell and bring them back to medical care. So they randomized them to pre-hospital antibiotics versus just going to pick them up and bring them back. And in doing this, they had a different time in antibiotic delivery of 3.4 hours um, in, by giving them at scene versus taking them back to the hospital. 
And when they looked at 28-day mortality, they had a control of 50, mortality of 56% versus 42%. So a statistically significant difference in mortality, you can see there of around 14%. P-value is 0 0.049. Yeah, interesting. So therefore, for septic shock, we recommend that patients that present to the triage, to triage with sepsis and have a solid pressure less than 90 should be made a CTAS-1. They should be seen as soon as possible to initiate the following, to get antibiotics within one hour, get their cultures taken before their antibiotics, and have a second liter of crystalloid started within the first hour. And I'll discuss fluid in the next session. Now, what about patients with severe sepsis? Well, again, I've published a study from last year um, looking at this. Oh, sorry about that. You can see that there's uh, 300 patients randomized to aggressive resuscitation algorithm, and they looked at delivery of antibiotics with respect to two things. One, either shock, or two, having an elevated lactate. So either one of those two things could get you into the study. And when they looked at mortality, you can see that if they got their antibiotics before shock was recognized, they had a mortality of 11%. And if they got their antibiotics after the shock was recognized, they had a mortality of 23%. And that was either a high lactate or hypotension. So you doubled your mortality. What was interesting in this study, though, they did not find the same stepwise change that Kumar found in escalating mortality per hour of delay of antibiotics. But again, a much smaller study than Kumar's. Another study done last year looking at the same concept. What they did is they took 261 patients who qualified for early goal-directed therapy. And they looked at their triage time to delivery of antibiotics but they also looked at when they met criteria for early goal-directed therapy and their time to antibiotics. So that could either be, again, shock or a high lactate. What they found is that the only groups that were statistically significant for triage to antibiotic time you see there at the top was the first hour, so getting the antibiotics in, in that first hour. And then they looked at qualification for um, early goal-directed therapy to getting their antibiotics. Again, the only one that was statistically significant was getting your antibiotics in that first hour. And again, 48% of those were cryptic shock, so a normal blood pressure with a high lactate. Therefore, for patients with severe sepsis, so if I have an initial lactate that's greater than four, we'd like to see the antibiotics given within one hour of the measurement of the lact elevated lactate, get their cultures before their antibiotics, and again, a second liter crystalloid started within one hour of uh, the measure of the elevated lactate. Now, hospitalized septic patients, so if your blood pressure is greater than 90 at presentation and your lactate is less than four, but you still came into the hospital to get IV antibiotics, we'd like to see the antibiotics given within three hours and the cultures before the antibiotics. But we do not want any specific recommendations on fluid resuscitation. And this is because we all know there's the elderly patients that are admitted um, for social reasons. They do receive antibiotics, but um, they do not need aggressive fluid resuscitation necessarily. Now, what should we choose as far as antibiotics in our emergency departments? Well, this is an entire lecture on itself, and I don't want to go into the details of it at this time. But generally, the concepts you need to follow is that you want to use broad-spectrum antibiotics. Make sure you get your cultures before your antibiotics, and once your cultures are available, you want to narrow your antibiotics. The reason for this is obviously you don't want a patient to be on broad-spectrum antibiotics longer than they need to be, not only so they don't develop resistance within themselves, but for societal reasons, so we don't develop more resistance in our community, in addition for financial reasons and the cost of the healthcare system with broad spectrum antibiotics. We do have online um, examples of pre-printed orders. Um, don't take the time to look at this in detail right now. Um, of the antibiotic selections we use at VGH as well as other sites. And the most important thing is that your own centers is to meet with your microbiologist and in your infectious disease people and come up with an appropriate set of antibiotics for your own institution. The final topic I'm going to talk about is fluid resuscitation. So our recommendations are that for the patients with severe sepsis and septic shock, they get a second liter crystalloid started within one hour, for the systolic plus 90, as I said, in the severe sepsis, the lactate greater than four. And why is it worded like this? Well, it's for twofold. One, we don't want the resuscitation to stop at a single liter getting in. We want that resuscitation to continue. So by emphasizing the second liter, we know that resuscitation is continuing on. And two, it also comes for documentation reasons. We do want to make sure that that first liter of fluid is in within the first hour, and the way that it's documented in nursing sheets, commonly it's not documented when the liter is done, but it is documented well when the second liter is hung. So by focusing on that, we can use that to show through documentation that our patients are getting their first liter in the first hour. Now, 
if you go back to Rivers' trial, the original data, again, we saw that these patients got three and a half liters in the control group and up to five liters in the early goal directed therapy group within the first hour. And you know what? These numbers are really consistent. If you look on the right hand side of the screen for all the trials that have gone through since looking at early sepsis management and uh, sepsis resuscitation, that number is pretty common, sort of two and a half, two to three liters in the control group, and the treatment groups all get around five liters of fluid. And from a, a paper that Rivers wrote back in 2006, he said that these patients obviously require high volume resuscitation, up to six to ten liters of fluid in the first 24 hours of their first resuscitation. Now, that is a lot of fluid, and a lot of people have difficulty with this. Most patients generally require two to five liters at least, as we've seen by those other trials. But six to ten liters, how do we know how much we need to give? And there's been some controversy about this recently, and people wonder, has the pendulum swung too far? And are we actually giving too much fluid blindly without knowing how to resuscitate them? This is a study published this year by the St. Paul's group, and they looked at their... Um, the vast trial they ran there, looking at basal press and septic shock, but then looked at the fluid that their patients required in their CVPs. And they actually found that patients that had a higher CVP and, required and got more fluid did worse. Hmm, interesting. Well, there's obviously an association there, not causation, but it's come out in a couple other papers as well. And people are comparing it now to burn resuscitation. Ever since the 70s, when Baxter um, made the Parkland formula for burn resuscitation, that 4 cc per kilo percent body surface area burn, we've seen this fluid creep in burn resuscitation and people getting too much fluid because there's so much emphasis on give fluid, give fluid, that in fact people started getting too much fluid. And um, once they hit sort of 6 cc per kilo percent body surface area burned, um, their mortality and morbidity went up significantly. So where does that leave us? What should we do in this scenario? Well, we do know that they probably need that two to five liters, but what are we going to do for that next five liters? When do we stop? Well, there's all three studies going on in the world right now trying to help answer this question. The PROCESS study um, out of the U.S., the ARISE study out of Australia, and the PROMISE study out of the U.K., and they all, thank God, got together and they decided they're going to do a massive meta-analysis of all their trials to help give us an answer to how to resuscitate sepsis patients. For example, the process study, what they're doing is it's trying to put 650 patients per arm in 20 universities, and what they want to have is a usual care arm, sepsis teams, so early, attentive, aggressive therapy, that you don't necessarily have to put the CPC line in and measure CVPs and central venous oxygen sets, and then a third arm, which is the Rivers Early Gale Directed Group, and hopefully this will give us more information on how to deal with these patients. What about patients with a history of CHF and, um, and the elderly? This is one of the most common questions I get. Well, if we look at Rivers' trial, he had no elderly cutoff. He just had to be greater than 18. He did have exclusions of acute MI, acute pulmonary edema, and acute dysrhythmia, but nothing about heart failure. If you actually look at the patients in his study, the average age is around 65, and up to 30% of them, to 30, 30 and 35%, had a history of heart failure. And with this, we still saw that absolute risk reduction of 16%, a number needed a treat of seven. So patients with heart failure did well as well. Well, here's a study done from last year where they actually looked at early gold record therapy for sepsis in patients that had pre-existing left ventricular dysfunction. And what they did is they looked at a database of 1,200 patients, and 183 of them had echo-documented systolic dysfunction, less than 50%. And of those, 135 patients did not complete early goal directed therapy, where 48 of the patients did. Of the ones that got through early goal directed therapy, they had a mortality of 17% versus 36.3% in the ones that did not. What about the elderly specifically? Well, again, this is a study done in 2008 where they looked at septic shock specifically in older adults. It was a single center study looking at patients greater than 65. I'm going to highlight some of the important points here on their table one. So average age was around 75, about 20 to 25% had heart failure or history of CHF. If you look at the lactate levels in this study population, very high, seven to eight was their initial lactate levels. The treatment group got around a liter and a half more fluid than the control group, similar to Rivers. 90 to 95 got their antibiotics, which in the first four hours, and this is the mortality difference. So. 61 versus 45%, the exact same one Rivers found, 16% absolute risk reduction in mortality. So what can we take from this? Well, early goal-directed therapy appears safe. 
But I hope I can convince you that if there's any patient group that you'd want to do early goal directed therapy in, it's actually the elderly and the ones with a history of heart failure. As I said earlier on, what early goal directed therapy really is doing is looking at the blood coming back to the right side of the heart to make sure you're delivering enough oxygen. So if patients had a history of a poor pump or risk of having a poor pump, they're the ones that might need augmentation of their cardiac output to improve their oxygen delivery. So personally, the people I'm more likely to put the central line in and do early goal directed therapy in are the patients that are the old ones or have a history of heart failure. But the other question we have is, is blind aggressive fluid resuscitation safe? If we took all comfers and gave them 8 to 10 liters of fluid, is that safe? Well, it doesn't sound safe, does it? But what we do conclude is that anyone, no matter what their history, if they have a history of septic shock, or sorry, no matter what their history, if they do have septic shock or they have severe sepsis of lactate greater than 4, giving one liter in the first hour is safe. Now, in the future, with these previous these trials going on, I think we're going to hear more about pulse pressure variation, looking for fluid responsiveness, using echocardiography to look at fluid responsiveness, as well as IBC diameter collapsibility. I think we're going to see sepsis teams, such as the PROA study, using well-defined algorithms to resuscitate people in good, recessive, um, aggressive care. But finally, if you need something until those trials come out, what I always say is that giving a really good fluid test is the secret. So if you have someone that you're wondering if they're still volume responsive, do they need more fluid, give them a good, life, it's a good test. Give them either 500 cc's of colloid or a liter of crystalloid under pressure and look for improvements in an organ perfusion. So does their heart rate come down? Does their blood pressure come up? Are their levofred requirements less? Do they put out more urine? Is their lactate clearing? So all of those markers, watching those all simultaneously resuscitate. And if it looks like you're giving fluid with no improvement, obviously you're probably not getting um, a good bang for your buck with giving fluid any longer. If you're interested in this, we still have videos on the E2E website um, on how to fluid, um, fluid resuscitation in elderly patients. And finally, um, we do have non-measured recommendations in our guidelines basically on source control and escalation. So source control, very, very important in emphasizing that we have to make sure if there's a pocket of pus somewhere in the body, you have to get that pus out or you won't start this inflammatory cascade. In addition, we also discuss escalation of therapy. So if you remain hypotensive, and if your lactate is not clearing, that consider doing early goal-directed therapy and quantitative resuscitation. If you're interested in these topics, this is a really great paper from June of this year by Paul Merrick um, from Annals of Intensive Care, and he goes through going beyond the guidelines and being the surviving sepsis guidelines, and he has recommendations on how to resuscitate people in um, the emergency department, um, and he actually removes CDP and centrovenous oxygen sac completely from the algorithm. So if you're interested, look that paper up. I quickly just want to go through the reportable emergency department measures um, that we're going to, that currently most of the health authorities are looking at how we're going to acquire these measures. And my next talk is on next month, on December 9th. Um, but we're going to be doing percentages of patients. We're going to be looking at percentage of patients who received antibiotics by time goal, percentage of patients who had blood cultures taken before IV antibiotics, percentage of patients who had second liter of crystal initiated by time goal, percentage of patients who had appropriate lactate measurements by time goal, and again, mortality. So more to come on that. We do assess the tools that are available on the E2E and the CCM website. Um, uh, this is the E2A website, and then this is our CCM website, which I'll put up on the last slide. But you can see down on this side, there's a resource section. You can go and download the different resources we've made available, as well as just the guidelines right online. We have emergency department sepsis management by, um, getting started packages that will help you work through starting your own protocols. Um, we have sepsis posters that you can actually put up in your own departments and as well as examples of our pre-printed orders. So in summary, uh, sepsis protocols improve mortality. I want you to really focus on measuring the lactate, measure early and measure it often. Get your antibiotics in in less than one hour. Get your blood cultures taken before your antibiotics. And get your second liter of fluid initiated in the first hour. In the first hour and CCM is coming and we're here to support you. And if you ever have any questions, please feel free to um, either reach me through the um, BCA uh, webpage or email me directly. Okay, guys, well, I'm going to open it up to questions to see if anyone has any comments or any questions that I can help you with. Well, thank you very much, David. Um, this is Julian. I just wanted to... Um, 
ask people if they have a question. We've left everybody muted just because of the feedback, but if you have a question, there is a hand icon at the uh, lower left-hand corner of the panel um, under all the names. And if you could raise that, we'll uh, unmute you, and then uh, you can certainly ask your question. The other way you can ask a question is uh, by through the chat box as well, if you, for some reason you haven't got your microphone hooked up or your phone's not working. Um, so, uh, Dave, I just wanted to ask you a question. You're, you're um, obviously not talking about um, things like vasopressors and, and uh, transfusions today, um, blood transfusions. We're, we're, um, will you be talking about that, or, or do you think there's uh, any need to? And where, where do you stand on those two issues around, um, uh, first of all, vasopressors, uh, yep. and all blood transfusions? And uh, do you want to comment on that now, or just talk about sure. it? Sure. Yeah, I, I was planning on talking about that in the future as well, but I'll give a quick answer. Um, as far as what vasopressors to use, um, there's been a couple studies in the last few years that have come out on this, and the only conclusions we can make from this is that levofed is better than dopamine. So often we do use dopamine in the emergency department because it's pre-made and it's available to be given peripherally, but there is literature now that supports that if you use dopamine um, for your initial resuscitation pressure, you do have more um, cardiac dysrhythmias. Now, there wasn't a difference in mortality necessarily, but more dysrhythmias, and it's an okay as a bridging tool, but we should try to get on to norepinephrine or levofed as cleanly as possible. Now, there was another study that compared um, norepinephrine or levofed to epinephrine as an infusion in severe septic shock, and they found no difference in that group. So epinephrine is also um, um, an appropriate vasopressor to choose. But because of our lack of familiarity with it, um, almost all clinicians currently are using levofed. Um, as far as um, blood transfusion, that's an interesting one, and it's still debated quite hotly. Um, if you know, the, the literature from Rivers' trial actually suggests that hemoglobins of around 100 is what they were going for. But talking to people throughout the country and who are involved in transfusion research, uh, such as Paul Dubé out of, um, out of um, Montreal, he's, they most likely think that a transfusion goal of the mid-80s is probably appropriate. And again, it's hard to know following the central venous oxygen stats if giving, um, if they're low, that giving blood is actually improving your oxygen delivery, as I stated before, because those hemoglobin molecules have a tendency to hold on to that oxygen. So it may make your numbers look better, but you're actually not improving the clinical scenario with the blood. Mm -hmm. So that would be my recommendation currently. So if you're treating someone with severe sepsis septic shock, you want sort of the hemoglobin in sort of that 80 to 85 range, but transfusing up to 100 is probably not warranted at this time. Okay. okay, thank you. And, and when are you uh, indicating to start vasopressors? So um, that, that um, paper by Paul Merrick there, so my usual recommendations are that if you've given two liters of fluid and you're still hypotensive, that's when I'd like to see vasopressors started. So the two to three liters of crystal oil, two, um, 20 to 30 cc per kilo of given of fluid and they're still hypotensive, you should be considering starting vasopressors at that time. Now, we all know that you get two liters in, sometimes they're hovering around that 90 mark, and you give another liter or two, and then their blood pressure comes up, their heart rate comes down, and they seem to clinically stabilize. That is appropriate, but officially we'd like to see sort of around the two liter mark, vasopressors being initiated and fluid resuscitation continuing at that point. Great, thank you. Um, uh, as I don't see any other hands up right now, I'll apply you with one more question. Uh, in your practice, how often are you measuring lactates, and how are you doing that? Um, so, as you can tell from my presentation, is I'm really keen on lactate measurements and repeat lactate measurements. Um, so I usually will do, um, obviously, initial lactate. Um, that's when I see people as an emergency physician or an intensivist, is I always want to lactate um, measured as soon as I see the patient, because I think it does provide clinical information. And then, what, depending on their clinical stability, I'd like to see another one measured every two to four hours until I'm confident that they are stabilizing clinically. And I also... Um, preach to the nurses within my facility as well, is that I think they should have the liberty to measure lactates as well. And, and the reason I, I argue for this is that if a nurse is worried um, or an RT is worried about a patient and they put a lactate on a blood gas or they add a lactate to a blood sample they sent off, under no circumstances someone comes up to me and they say, well, this patient's lactate is seven and I never clinically thought about it or I never ordered it myself, I always want to know that number. So within reason, I think it's appropriate for any of the allied healthcare staff to order a lactate if they're generally concerned about someone. Excellent. Thank you.
And, and uh, sorry, one last question. Like, um, sure. Please, uh, if others have questions, uh, put your hand up. What about what about intubation? What about um, uh, your timing of intubation? When do you think, hey, this uh, this will really this person will really benefit if I take away the work of breathing uh, and and let them concentrate on uh, trying to fight off this infection um, and shock? What uh, what's your approach to that? Do you wait for their? Uh, well, anyway, I'll let you answer that. Yeah. That's a harder question to answer because um, a lot of it, I think, comes down to clinical intuition and experience. Um, obviously, if you're seeing changes in the parameters um, of their oxygenation from the blood gases being either respiratory failure with hypercarbia or hypoxia ensuing, obvious indication. Um, if it looks like they're tiring out and their work of breathing is excessive, obvious indication. If their level of consciousness is dropping, obvious indication. I'd actually recommend that truly shock in itself is an indication. So significant shock. So if you're looking at someone and you're resuscitating them aggressively and their blood pressure is remaining low and it looks like their clinical course is going to continue to deteriorate, I'm always a proponent of intubating early versus later. And this is what I mean by the clinical intuition component of it, is that after seeing enough cases, you know when things aren't going to go well. And you might as well get on it and intubate them early versus wait to the point that you're in a crisis and you're intubating them emergently rather than urgently. I know that's not a, a detailed answer, but that's that's probably the most appropriate one for this time. Does that make sense? Oh, yeah, that's great. It makes sense. It makes a lot of sense, David. Um, so thank you very much. Um, I'll just uh, check around the, the board here. If anybody has any questions, um, please uh, raise your hand. Or uh, okay. Looks In like addition, if you guys have other if you have other questions you want to ask me outside of the forum. Um, again, my email is available on the website, and please, anytime. Okay, thanks, Dave. Oh, we have two oh, questions, oh, and, and uh, okay. I'll start off with, um, I don't know which hand went up first, but also I'll start with Jim, and uh, then we have a second question. So, Jim, could you ask your question, please? Hey, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Oh, okay, thanks. Thanks, David. I enjoyed the talk very much. Um, a lot of practical advice, and um, although this wasn't the central focus, I'd, I'd like to just ask you a little more about Julian's last question because I, I do look, worry a little bit and so I, I'm never very clear myself on this issue of timing of intubation because in a shocky patient when we take over the, the, the um, breathing using negative intrathoracic pressure and switch it to positive, um, there's a, a real risk and I've always thought that and I've seen cases where there's a, there's a real risk that we in fact reduce their blood pressure and probably their perfusion even further which is contrary to what we're trying to achieve. So would you have any uh, more advice on us, to us on how you would mitigate that um, resulting drop in blood pressure at the point when we switch over from negative to positive pressure ventilation? Yeah, excellent question. And um, this is a component of one of my other talks. I actually walked through intubating the septic patient. And so you're, you're bang on. The concept is if your intravascular deplete that your mean systemic pressure, the pressure driving blood back from your peripheries and organs to your heart is low. Therefore, if you increase your intrathoracic pressure, you put an imbalance to that pressure system. So therefore, there's more pressure poking back on the blood returning to the heart, and therefore you get no blood returning to the heart and no cardiac output. You drop your preload and you can actually have a cardiac arrest. So how do you prevent this? Well, good fluid resuscitation is the first off. So if you can wait to put, let's say, two, three, four liters to get the fluid into the body initially, so you can increase your venous pressure and your blood return to back to the right side of the heart, that is key. And in addition, starting with vasopressors, so commonly with these patients, if I have time to put a central line in, I will, so I can use higher levels of vasopressors. If I don't have a central line, I'll start five mics of levo off peripherally, even if their blood pressure seems to be tolerating at the moment. The drug of choice for induction is very important. So for example, using ketamine, which has sympathomimetic effects, will help mediate the drop in blood pressure from many of your other induction agents, such as benzodiazepines. And additionally, using a pure alpha agonist, such as phenylephrine. So quickly, so my combination would be, I'd have two large or four IVs, two bags of pressure going as fast as I can, 
I'd have levofed at five mics per minute going peripherally. I'd use ketamine, um, sort of doses in the five, 50 to 100 range, along with my paralytic agent, such as sexual choline. And finally, I'd give 200 mics of phenylephrine with my ketamine on the initial push and repeat PRN as needed, up to every 30 seconds to a minute if needed. Does that answer your question somewhat? Um, I'm not sure. Yes, yes, it does. Thank you very much. Yeah, yeah. So the answer is yeah, they do drop the blood pressure, but sometimes you just have to intubate them with that shocky state. And just to prepare with the correct way is using the right drugs and using aggressive fluid as you're doing it. Is it really that good? David, um, I'm going to hand it over now to um, Lynn. Um, I think you're up next. If uh, you want to ask a question, please, Lynn. Yeah, um, well, I'm the secure director at VGH, and I'm, we're still having issues with um, the uptake of the PPOs and even the proper. Uh, triaging of these patients as CTAS 2 or CTAS 1. So I was actually interested in um, other centers, how they've managed to um, get by. Hello? Sorry? Did you hear the question, David? I, I think so. I think so. You're asking about um, how we have difficulty getting patients triaged as CTAS 1. And do yeah. anyone else have experience in doing that? Um, and PPOs. I, yeah, and PPOs. You know, I'd say truthfully, we, we, we're we doing quite well in the grand scheme of things at VGH. I know we still do have our difficulties and we still have a lot of, um, a lot of work to do. Um, but in the grand scheme of things, we're actually not doing too bad compared to other centers. As far as getting people classified as CTAS-1, um, this is one of the recommendations new to the guidelines, so I don't think a lot of people have been trying that um, as much as we'd like. And as we're going to find out in BGH in the next couple months, and actually it's, it's going to be a lot of education and a lot of education feedback um, through techniques such as our report card that you've initiated then, um, and feeding information back to the triage nurses as well as the EPs when the situation could have been handled better, such as their, tria, their, their CTAS scoring. Yeah, have David, you seen what other centers have done? Um, yeah, if anyone has any other comments out there, it would be great to hear. Yeah, Lynn, it's just, as Julian, I, I know I think we're struggling with the same thing at, uh, at St. Paul's. Uh, certainly um, uh, the PPOs and the, and the protocol was initiated around the same time as you. And, um, you know, it's, it's been one of those things that uh, the fatigue factor, I think, sets in and people sort of, um, sort of forget about it, but um, yeah, I think it's just constant reminding, uh, and I think it's a case of uh, um, episodes, uh, events like this to keep the, uh, people aware of it. Uh, it's just one of those things. I think it's human nature over time to to let it to uh, to wane a bit. And I think what's really going to make a difference, though, is is as you um, uh, talked about, David, is is that we're going to start measuring this, and I think people will start to say, hey, we're maybe maybe we're not doing quite as well. As, as we thought we were. And, and uh, the other thing is, you know, it's the occasional case that didn't go well. In fact, we at, at St. Paul's had a, last month at our M&M rounds had a case that clearly was septic shock and was clearly recognized as having septic shock. And she uh, came in, actually I wasn't involved in the case, but she, uh, I know about the case, um, so I don't know the details. She, she came in, I believe, and um, all the end box were ordered and foods were ordered, but everything was not done in a timely fashion. It was not done, the end box were not given fast enough and stuff. So th things like that that just allows us to bring it forward back to the group again and everybody sort of does a gut check on it. That's the best answer I have. I don't know if other people have thoughts on that. And I was going to say, Lynn, like I really think your idea and your concept of having the report cards available um, that we're going to be doing with our M&M rounds it is key, and I think this is going to help a lot, and I hope to actually take our experience and your initiative with doing the report cards and bringing it back to this forum and showing how we can help improve sort of the, re the recognition and the CTAS scoring by feeding back to the triage nurses as well as the physicians. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we'll see how th that goes, yeah, hopefully. Yeah. Okay, um, I think uh, we're over time, so uh, I'm going to say uh, thank you very much again, David. It was excellent to talk as always.
And uh, thank you very much, everybody, for, for attending this morning. And we will have another session uh, in about two weeks or so. It's what the date is actually December 9th. And um, please look out for the advertisement for that. So we'll be coming back at you uh, in a couple of weeks from now. Thank you very much, everybody, and have a great day. Thanks. Thanks, everybody.